So I'm Rob Coe, I work for Evidence-Based Education. I also work for the Education Endowment Foundation. Before that I was an academic at Durham University and before that I was a teacher, maths teacher. And I'm going to talk a bit about CPD, obviously a lot of overlap with what Beth's already said there. Um, I think this is one of the hardest things that any teacher or school leader can try and get right. I think it's also one of the most important things that any teacher or school leader can devote their attention to because it's, um, it's all about how you become a better teacher or how you allow colleagues around you to become better teachers and if we're not able to do that then we're just stuck in as good as we are. Um, so it really matters and it, it is hard to do because like any other kind of learning it, it's tough, it takes time, it takes the right kind of support and I also think we don't really have a culture in teaching where this is seen as a high priority. You know, the idea that you need to find a few hundred pounds to uh, go on a course or undertake a program of training is, is very often a barrier and yet as a proportion of what it costs to employ you or a proportion of um, the value that that gives to the, all the students you teach for the rest of your life, it's a tiny, really insignificant amount of money. And I know budgets are tight and I know the real world is that you can't find that money, but that just says something about the value to me. So um, I guess that's easy for me to say not working in a school. Okay, so um, just before, uh, th so here are some of the um, sources that I think, and, and Beth's already <coughs> mentioned some of these. So the, uh, the standard here, which um, uh, as you say, who's read this standard here? Who's familiar with that? Okay. Uh, um, so uh, I think that's a, a re as DfE documents go, that's a relatively good one. I uh, probably shouldn't say that because I was part of the group that helped to write it, but uh, this is, I was also part of the group that helped to write this, so this is a much shorter summary. Who's seen this one, Developing Great Teaching? Okay, it's a bit of a handful of people. Is that you're either very shy or you haven't read these things. So, uh, and this one, Beth also mentioned, the Helen Timperley. Anybody read that? It is about 300 pages. Okay, one, well done. Well done to you, sir. You get the prize. You're what? All oh, right. Okay. Standing up for your own. Yeah. It is. It's good, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it is quite long. It's kind of, I guess, seen as the authority really on the research. I know it's. Um, was it 2008 that study? I can't remember. It's a while ago. It's at least about 10 years. Yeah. Um, but I would say it's still the kind of definitive go-to source of evidence, probably on this. And uh, this one's newer. I don't. Linda Darling Hammond. Anybody read that? Seen it? One. Okay. Well done, Ruben. Uh, so that's also quite good, I think. That's a newer publication and worth having a look at. Um, I don't, Jamie, are we making these slides available somehow? Have we thought about that? We'll do now. Yeah. We will have to, won't we? Because I've <laughs> said. Uh, so if, if you do want the slides, then obviously the, the references are in the, in the notes page and you'll be able to get them there. But you'll be able to find, if you just Google Effective Teacher Professional Development, Linda Darling Hammond, I'm sure you'll find that straight away. These are all online and free, by the way. They're not, I don't tend to recommend stuff that you have to have journal subscriptions or pay for, although sometimes I will. Okay, so another thing that we did when we did the uh, Developing Great Teaching Review, and I do think that's quite uh, focused and short, you know, it is only about 10 pages and it does condense what the evidence says. But I still think it's quite hard to know, well, what are the really key things that we need to do? So we tried to produce this checklist, which I'm pretty sure no one will have seen. Tell me I'm wrong. Has anyone seen this? No? Okay, because it's really hidden. It is on the TDT website. You can see the link there, uh, tdtrust.org slash cpdtest. So it is up there, but it hasn't particularly been promoted or looked at. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I could. No, thank you. Um, and it's just 10 questions about, with yes, no answer, you know, have you done these things? So when you think about the CPD you've undertaken in, say, the last year, or if you're leading CPD, uh, what's been the focus of the learning? Is it something that's actually supported by research evidence? Can you tick that one as a yes? Um, have, when you've been doing this, have you always had in your mind the link between how if I learn this will this lead to students being able to do something that seems important a bit better than they can at the moment. 
Uh, and again, always making that mechanism really explicit. And then have you done the kind of activity to help you learn that? So around uh, challenging and surfacing your own thinking, allowing you to experiment and adapt and try things for yourself, having somebody else watch you do it and feedback on how you're doing that, and doing that on a regular basis, at least monthly, over at least two terms. Uh, so anybody so far think they could tick all, all six of those in the work you, CPD work you've done this year? Okay, anybody think they could tick more than one of those? Yeah, go on, put your, be brave. Okay, more than one, that's about half, yeah? Okay, who could tick four of them? Okay, well, uh, I suggest to you, if you can't, then uh, maybe just go through the last four. So ex explicit support, external expertise. I, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have to be external, but it has to be expert. Uh, peer networks, I think that's one that often people do get right, having uh, collaboration going, that's a natural mode. Coaching and mentoring, is that built into the program? And have you got support from school and college leaders? So uh, if you haven't got all 10, or at least a reasonable proportion of them, then I don't think you should be surprised if your CPD is a waste of time and it's having no impact on your students' learning because you're not doing what the evidence says you need to do in order for it to do that. Um, okay, so I was just going to talk about four pitfalls reasonably quickly, which I think are reasonably common and you may think they are or not. So number one is that people focus on trying to learn to do something that really isn't going to make any difference because there's no evidence to say that if you get better at this thing, students will benefit in any way. And those, uh, those uh, documents there are basically just sources of evidence about uh, what, you know, what teachers do that makes a difference to learning or how students learn. And I'm sure people will recognize those. And you know, if you've been to any talks here and at other similar conferences, you'll have heard people talk about those things. And there could be plenty of others up there. But I guess the point I'm making is that you have to have that background knowledge about research and evidence and how that relates to teaching. And if you don't have that, you're unlikely to make good choices about what you invest your CPD time in. And therefore, you probably invest it, or there's a risk that you invest your time trying to learn some, to do something that isn't actually going to make any difference. Obviously, that would be a waste of time. OK, so then number two, I think, is that we assume there's something special about teachers that makes them not like uh, human beings, and in particular in the way they learn. And this is a bit odd because you're all teachers, well, maybe you're not all teachers, but most of you assume are teachers or have been. Some of you escape teachers, maybe. So you know a bit about how to get people to learn stuff. That's your day job. The trouble is you don't always apply that to when you're thinking about your own learning. So the, the message is quite simple, really. You know how to help people to learn hard things. And when you're thinking about your own professional learning, the same rules apply. So these are the kinds of rules I'm talking about that, you know, if you're teaching, uh, I don't know, year 10, the carbon cycle, or whatever it might be, you need to know where your learners are at before you start teaching them that, don't you? You need to be clear with them and with yourself what it is you want them to learn and what success looks like. You need to have high expectations that challenge them. You need to do assessment. There's nobody here in this room who would say, when I'm teaching, I don't do assessment, is there? So why is it different for teachers learning? Why, why wouldn't we assess teachers in their learning too? Well, okay, all sorts of reasons. But that's one of the barriers, I think. That's one of the reasons why we're not learning in the way we should, and so on. You know, we could quibble about all these things, but basically the point is that the same kind of principles apply. Anything that you wouldn't think was going to work with, you know, trying to teach year threes how to do column addition, uh, if it wouldn't work there, then it probably won't work for you either. Number three is about trust. Again, I think people often think about this, but not always very clearly. This is a source I really like, uh, uh, Ch Shannon Moran and Hoy, writing about, uh, this is an actual s empirical study about trust and what trust means and how it interacts with effectiveness in school and in particular growth in school. So schools where there is professional learning and teachers grow and improve are characterized by high trust environments and high trust environments means 
this kind of thing. And they say, well, these are, they, there are these trust is about willingly making yourself vulnerable to someone else. So you choose to e expose yourself to a risk. You put your future in their hands in some way that really matters to you. And the reason you might do that is because you believe these five things about them. And if you don't believe those five things, you're unlikely to do that. So that's part of the culture that you need. And it isn't just about teachers trusting senior leaders, although that's, that's important. It's about teachers trusting other colleagues. It's about teachers trusting students. You, you make yourself vulnerable to them as well. And the wider community, the parents and everybody else. And these are hard, hard um, criteria to meet, I think. But uh, having it spelt out like that potentially is helpful. I hope it is. And then number four is just about the time it takes and how hard this is to do. You're trying to learn something really hard like, um, um, well, you mentioned cognitive load theory. So, you know, actually embedding that into your pedagogy, that is a really, really hard thing to do. It's not going to happen by hearing one person talk about cognitive load theory or reading one book, however good about cognitive load theory and thinking, aha, right, I'm going to go off and do that. That's not going to have any impact at all. These are hard things to learn. You need to think hard about what it is you're going to change. You need to have someone else who's really good at doing that watch you try and make that change and tell you, aha, okay, you're doing some of this in a way that is not completely hopeless, but here's how you improve that. And they need to keep watching you and keep feeling back. And if you think you've ever learned any hard thing in your life, in, in a way that's easier than that. You know, you think about other things you've learned in sport or um, in uh, other areas, uh, music or, you know, playing chess or any a number of examples. That's the kind of model you've followed. So why would it be different when you're trying to change your teaching practice, which, if you've been teaching more than five minutes, is pretty firmly embedded already. You know, you've got these routines and they work, so they're hard to change, like any other habit. You know, going to the gym is hard because it's a habit that's hard to change. So I think this uh, work from Ericsson is really useful on here. Uh, Peak, which is a kind of general book, and then this more specific education version from the Deans for Impact. And he, he has this idea of what he calls deliberate practice, which is like practice but different. And it's different in the way that, that again, these five characteristics of uh, breaking complex tasks into subtasks that are manageable, getting feedback on those tasks, having goals that are really specific and challenging, and this idea of mental representations, the idea that you have to know what the good looks like in your head before you can start to learn to do it. And all of that's really important, I think. So just practice isn't enough. You have to have the right conditions for the right kind of practice, just doing more and more. You know, if you've been teaching 10 years, you've had a lot of practice, but it may not have met these, met these criteria. Okay, and uh, Gusky's five levels, again, Beth mentioned that. I'm actually not a big fan of this. So the reason I mention it is to say that I think uh, it's an area that we're planning to do some work on and have done already a bit, because I think we need to say a bit more about the underlying mechanisms of how we expect a particular body of training or body of learning to lead to improvement, and that's nowhere in Gusky's model. Um, I think I'm not really interested in uh, participants' reactions, you know, did they like the lunch or whatever, but I am interested in did their thinking change. So if they're asking me in the corridor about, um, you know, different kinds of theories of learning, well, that is a change and that's interesting, but that's really only step three. And I want to see that change in their thinking turn into change in their practice, that's step four. I also want that change to be sustained, that's step five. So relatively easy, I think to get teachers to change their practice for one lesson when they're all enthused. You know, I've been to Wellington College, I heard this fabulous idea on Monday morning, I'm going to try this thing out, and you try it out. Okay, are you still doing it in six months' time on a regular basis? Because if you're not, you haven't reached step four. No, sorry, five. And then I'm interested in impact on student outcomes, and of course that's the most important thing, but it's also really, really hard to evaluate that. And then even harder, is to track those changes in student outcomes in any kind of rigorous way back to the actual change. Can we attribute that change in the student outcome to the, that particular bit of learning? And of course that's even harder. And that, but it is important, so it's got to be on the list, 
but we shouldn't feel that unless we can do that, we haven't evaluated. So that's step seven. So as I say, that's work in progress. And that is everything that I had planned to say, and hopefully we've got a moment for questions. Thank you. Thank you.